Hello and welcome to This Week in the Word as we prepare for the 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So glad that you're able to join together with us today. I'm so glad that we have our producer, Teresa, back with us. And Andy, we miss you and we look forward to seeing you back as videographer next week. Congratulations on the baptism. Father Jeff, how are you doing today? Well, I'm, I'm great. I'm great. That's the baptism of Andy's son, Joel, not Andy's baptism. So oh, just very to true. clarify Thank that. you, thank you. So I am doing well. I am doing well. Excellent, excellent. So today we are going to dive into some readings from the book of Genesis. Our second reading, we have left the book of James now. We're going into Hebrews, Hebrews. chapter 2, and then we'll get into our gospel here in a little while. Uh, so as we open up today and we look at this first reading, Father, we're going to have this mm -hmm. reading from the book of Genesis, and it's going to be found in chapter 2, verses 18 yes. through 24. Uh, many people will recognize this reading um, as we have this reading about man and woman kind of being at the center of God's creation. Mm -hmm. And um, and we see that there's a complementariness. I never mm -hmm. know how to say a word right there, but uh, the, they're complementary towards one another. Complementary. <laughs> so, um, and that the woman is a help fit or mm -hmm. a help meet, if you look at that authorized mm -hmm. version, to the mm -hmm. man. Um, and then there's all kinds of theories about the rib. Can you break this uh, reading open to us and the significance here? Sure, sure. When we look at this reading, what we find in chapter 2, we often look at these first two chapters of Genesis as, do we believe creation occurred historically this way or didn't occur historically this way? And the point of the chapters isn't to say this is historical documentation or not. The church believes you can believe either way with that. The point is to see the deeper meaning as in all scripture passages of, of what God is saying to us. And so what we find here is not just an account of creation, but we find, especially in Genesis chapter 2, the story of the love of God for humanity. It's there in chapter 1, but it becomes more explicit in chapter 2, where God creates Adam, man, the word Adam, man, and he molds him out of the earth. And in molding him out of the earth, he is a work of art, like a sculptor works with clay. And then what we find is God breathes his life into him. God breathes his life into him, thus filling him with a divine life within him, not a separate divine life from God, but God's very life within him. And then God looks and finds that Adam is not happy. And, and so he says, I will make a suitable partner for him. And he fashions all the birds of the air and fish of the sea and wild animals and all this. And he makes them out of the clay of the earth as well. But he does not breathe his life into them. And so they come to life by his command. But none prove to be a suitable partner. So we find God loving man. Now in this story here, I say... I don't care what you say about the historicity of chapter one or not, but in this chapter, if you're saying this is absolutely historical, then you're saying God is not all knowing because he found that Adam wasn't happy with all these things. The story is told for the deeper meaning of God's care and love for Adam. And then he puts Adam in a deep sleep and draws a rib out of Adam and fashions it into Eve, so that same creative spirit. But what's interesting here that I think we don't, we often look at in a wrong way is God made Adam out of the clay of the earth. He made the animals too and formed them out of the ground. Mm -hmm. But they aren't united. God takes from Adam, takes from the man, and of his very substance makes Eve to show that they are one. That's how they come flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. That's why the draw is there, because they complete each other. Right. And so that's a very important sign. God loves Adam and Eve and fashions them, fashions them together. Now, we have to remember the name Adam, while we attribute it to the person in the story, mm -hmm. also means all of humanity. Yes. And so we find that, that God loves them and fashions them and brings them together. And then man finds that they are complete in this. He yeah. finds a flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. And then it goes on to say, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one flesh. 
And this is significant that it's not just, well, here's what happened, but here's what you need to get out of this, you know. A man leaves his father and mother. In other words, when a husband and wife, when a man and woman come together to form a family, there is something new to that dimension that isn't simply an addition to a family that's there. Yes. It is, they're formed in a new way. Now, often back in that culture, it was the woman who left the man. Mm -hmm. But the point is the man leaves life as he knew it to take on this new life with his wife. Clearly, this is uh, written from a male perspective. That's the history of the time and that. But when we look at that, we can see several things that can speak to us today. Number one, woman in the story is not understood to be um, subsidiary or having come from the man and therefore she is less. Right. They're equal by the substance that they are made of and they are of one and drawn together in that. And that the unity, the equality of them both as being made in God's image and functioning in that way mm -hmm. is a gift before the fall. The inequity that occurs after the fall is the alienation of people. The fall by the fall, I mean original sin. We don't continue to say, well, here are the effects of original sin. Therefore, we don't try to overcome them. We work to overcome them. Yes. And so we find in this, this act of love of God for humanity and that humanity is then meant because we're made in the image of God filled with the breath of God, we are meant to love as God loves. Yes. And so we find the sense of self-giving and, and nurturing there between the man and the woman. And you were talking about Adam uh, being mm -hmm. human being, that uh, Hebrew for the woman, Ezer Konegdo, uh -huh. literally is a helper, like yep. the type of help mm -hmm. that you normally would only yep. get from God. Right. Sometimes yep. you see that reference. So, so men out there, remember, uh, your wife is a gift from God. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the fact that she is called a helper does not make her subservient, but makes her a necessity for right. life. Right. If yeah. you wouldn't consider that kind of help from God to be he's your servant, then we mm -hmm. can't look at it yeah. the other way around right. either. Right. So my mentor used to say uh, she came from, not exactly theological, but mm -hmm. she came from the rib because she's by your side. She yes. is right, right there with you. Uh -huh. and, and that word flesh literally means human being as compared nature. to the yes. nature of God. Right. So we're a complete human being right. when we're mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for yeah. breaking that down for us today um, as we take a look at that first reading. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to go on to Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 11. And this will be our first letter of Hebrews for I think the next six weeks. Right. And today and the next two Sundays, this author is going to begin building a case for us for the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, yes. the eschatological, yes. the end times mm -hmm. high priest of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. And although we can look, and if you want to be very literal, say, well, Jesus wasn't from the tribe of Levi. Right. He has every other qualification mm -hmm. here to mm -hmm. be our high priest from our, he talks about our common humanity, mm -hmm. our common origin. And then in verse mm -hmm. nine, he even calls us brothers. He calls us sisters. So could you break this reading? Sure, down for us? sure. First of all, well, as we look at the letter to the Hebrews, um, there's several central themes, but the one that this uh, our readings are going to hit on in many ways is going to be the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, who offered himself as the sacrifice for our salvation and is the high priest. And clearly he wasn't from the tribe of Levi, which is where all the Jewish priests came from, but he is of the line of Melchizedek, which is wider and greater than, um, than Levi. And so what we find then is that um, what's preceded is talking about Jesus as, as the one who came like us, God who becomes like us. And, and so we pick up here in that part, he for a little while, meaning his time on earth, was made lower than the angels, human, that by the grace of God he may taste death for everyone. And what we find there is that very notion of God humbles himself for us so that we might be raised up to God. And what is keeping us from that eternal life is death itself, which is seen as a punishment in this way, a reality of the result, the effect of sin. And so Jesus redeems us 
not by simply pulling us away from death, but by confronting death in an anguish, an, an agony of death, um, that we might be saved. Mm -hmm. And so um, he is made their leader of salvation, through, made perfect through suffering. Now, perfect there doesn't mean the same thing as I got a hundred on the test yes. because Jesus did not sin. Therefore, he does not seek perfection, but perfection in the sense of holiness. Mm -hmm. When Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, that echoes what was in the Old Testament um, in the right, I think it's in, I know it's in the Pentateuch, one of those yes. five books. Um, somewhere, in the somewhere, in the somewhere in the beginning. Somewhere in the beginning. Somewhere in the first, first 200 chapters of the Bible. Um, where it says, be holy as God is holy. Right. So we're talking about this coming to holiness and the image of suffering. Now that image of suffering may have been brought in there because this early church of Hebrews, which was not thought to be a specific community, right. but converts from Judaism to Christianity, mm -hmm. who were experiencing suffering and experiencing um, uh, suffering in drastic ways, he's tying that to that, that through the suffering of the cross, Jesus brings us to glory. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing that we find is in the Old Testament time, or in, the, um, in that time, Old Testament time and now, Suffering, discipline, was a sign of love by a parent. A parent who loved disciplined their child. When they did wrong, they disciplined them, but they also demanded of them discipline to grow to be who they are meant to be, yes. you know. So, and, and we still find this today, you know, that the person who grows up and has no skills in life because the, their parents just gave them everything they wanted, right. excused everything they did, has not really grown to their potential, which is really what a, a loving parent does. And help the link there to that discipline of learning, to the word disciple. To exactly, the to exactly. The learning, to the yes. growing. Yeah. So. And so what we find is that Jesus, through this act, draws us in. He who consecrates and those who are con being consecrated all have one origin. And therefore, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. When we stop and think that we are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, yes. that he didn't just make us disciples. He made us brothers and sisters who must follow a teaching, who must be his disciples and follow him, not just say, well, I have my um, uh, ancestry.com spiritual card that says, I'm related, but we live in union with him in union with the Father who is the source of all good that comes to us through Jesus Christ. So in this letter, what we hear here then calls us to reflect on, do I unite myself mm -hmm. to Christ? Do I unite myself to Christ? And in that, I mean, I think this goes along with the great commandment. We look and say, is what I do loving? Yes. We also can ask ourselves, is what I do united to Christ, not simply in his glory, in the victory, but also on the journey to that victory through the cross? Right. How do I live my life in this way? And that's what we're going to find unfolding in the weeks to come, which I think is really helpful for us, even though we might look and say, well, there's been times in our life of faith when things have been much, much more difficult for people, times of outright persecution, times such as in World War II, in, in worldwide plagues that had no vaccine, no mask and all of that, in times of social upheaval, that life has been harder. But even for us here and now, if we ask ourselves, do I bear the cross as Jesus bore his cross? Which means, do I bear the cross for others? Mm -hmm. Do I bear the cross, not just in the ones that are dumped upon me, but in a love and care for others. Stop and think if every Christian did that, mm -hmm. how would this world be a different place and a better place? You know, when I look at this reading, I often remember something my father said to me, which is that you're a Hollis and that has high expectations. When I read readings like this, I think about what it means to be a Christian. Yes. The expectations mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he's offered that to us mm -hmm. in love, but we don't abuse grace and mercy. Right. We've got to live this out. And there's also comfort to me in knowing that our high priest was tempted and tried just as yes. we were, 
He knows our infirmities. He can go to the Father yeah. on our behalf as mm -hmm. our high priest and say, mm -hmm. here's what they've gone through and here's what I've done yes. for them. Yeah. So. yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, we have time to move on to the Gospel of Mark now, and uh, we'll talk about the long version unless we run out of time. Right. So we're in chapter Good. 10, verses 2 through 16, and if we look at the long version, then we end up with two topics. Yes. Uh, a majority of it's going to be on divorce, but then also there's the part about uh, letting the children come unto Jesus mm -hmm. or the blessing of the children. And this reading starts off, as, as a lot of readings do, when we have Jesus and we have Pharisees mm -hmm. around with them trying to trip him up. Mm -hmm. So Jesus refuses to argue about legal loopholes we're going to see, but instead he reminds his listeners of the original plan for humans. So can you right. take us through this? All right. So in this, got, in this uh, version of the story, which there's uh, this version of Mark and a version of Matthew, the Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, is it lawful for, lawful for a man to divorce his wife? They were testing him. Mm -hmm. Now, all Jews believed divorce was allowed, but it was only allowed by a man. He had to give a writ of divorce, as Moses said. In other words, give a paper to, the, to his wife that says, you are free, from, free to marry. Right. You know? But Jesus has been teaching that there is no divorce. Yes that once two people are joined together, they're joined together in an um, unbreakable bond. So it's, it's clear that here they're trying to bring this subject up, which would be like, oh my gosh. In, in Matthew's gospel, they're like, um, if, when Jesus teaches this reading, they're like, afterwards they're like, oh my gosh, who can live this out? And Jesus says, it is lived out. It is to be lived out. So anyhow, at this point, they're trying to cause problems. And Jesus says, what did Moses command you? And they say, Moses permitted a husband to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. But Jesus told them, because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. I believe we just covered that not we, long ago. We just, did. <laughs> we just did. So Jesus is looking back to say, what was the original intent before the fall? Mm -hmm. And he says that you become one flesh. Now that one flesh aspect can be understood on many levels. It can be understood on the first level of, of uh, marital intercourse and the joining together is one flesh, which is not some incidental lustful thing God tolerates, mm -hmm. but is a sign of an act of love and total self-giving body and soul to another and receiving that gift from the other. But it also means to become one in living and self-giving to the other. And so we find that there. So Jesus says that, and then, um, uh, and so they're no longer two flesh but one. And what God has joined, no one must separate. No one must separate. Yeah. And so that teaching's there. Now, when we look at this, that's the end of the teaching. So we have a teaching that's difficult at that time to follow and difficult today for people to follow. And there's many, many pastoral things that have to be looked at in light of this command. Mm -hmm. It's not that we can just say, well, this is the way it is. So if you're unhappy, you just stick it out. And if you end up divorced, you're just on your own and, and we don't care about you. We have to be responsive to those things. Well, you know, and if I can just add something mm -hmm. in there, I always like to look uh -huh. at how many times we see certain phrases. And on that hardness of the heart, Jesus only used that two other times. Mm -hmm. And Jesus used the hardness of the heart in chapter 3, verse 5, when the Pharisees just really couldn't grasp and mm -hmm. they were upset with him for healing on the Sabbath. Uh -huh. And he used it again when they failed to understand the miracles of the loaves, talking about the mm -hmm. disciples. Yeah. Both other times he used the hardness of the heart. It wasn't so much as drastic outright sin as much as it seemed like yes. he was addressing this falling short of a standard. Yeah. You know, and so mm -hmm. as you said, the church has looked at that on many aspects, but mm -hmm. there's only two other times this was yeah. used, and it was always a mm -hmm. falling mm -hmm. short of a standard. Yeah. So and so and so we find that, that Jesus repeats that and says, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Those things we all have to look at, and the church is always willing to speak to anyone 
without judgment on the situation they might have of a second marriage or of the trauma of divorce. Because people don't end up divorced simply because they are obstinate, mean, unfaithful people. Often it is that they have tried their best mm -hmm. and this just isn't going to work. Right. And so that, you know, we have to be there. So I urge anyone who doesn't understand this and needs further explanation, feel free to call me, yes. feel free to express your frustration with it or anything so that we can look at possibilities that are there. Yes. Now, the other thing though, I think we need to look at is Jesus gives a teaching, but what is behind the teaching? Why does he say that? And he says it for two reasons. One is that it is given to us by God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what God has given, we must follow. The second thing is, though, that remember how we look back at Genesis and said, Adam had the life of God breathed into him, yes. as Eve did, and that Adam and Eve are made in the divine image, which we hear in the first chapter of Genesis. Right. We are to love as God loves. And that love, as we'll find out, in um, uh, that love reflects the love of God for his church in marriage. It's meant to be a love that goes beyond everyday love and concern and compassion for others. Yes. And so um, when we look at that, that's what we strive for. High standards, difficult standards to follow. Yes. Standards which cannot always be met, sometimes because of the willful sinfulness of people, other times because of what life has dumped on them. Right. And But we are not there to, to judge everyone and say, well, you this or that. I know many people who have had to struggle much more in a marriage that ended up not being successful than I've ever had to struggle in my priesthood. So I can't look at them and say, well, you don't try, you don't do this. They tried much harder than I've ever had to try. It's by the grace of God that I have not had to make those efforts. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's something for us to realize that uh, uh, we can't imagine the other cross the other person mm -hmm. bearing. We, yeah. we have a hard enough time mm -hmm. understanding yeah. and manip manipulating our own. You talk about not understanding marriage. Mm -hmm. I don't understand as a, a celibate mm -hmm. priest mm -hmm. what you've gone through, yes. the struggles you've yes. had to have. And, mm -hmm. and we make this journey together. I'm looking now to my producer to see where I'm at time-wise. All right, so we're going to do a quick synopsis mm -hmm. of the second half of this because mm -hmm. uh, I've gotten the notice now. And I want to talk just real quickly, if we can, sure. uh, about um, the second part of the reading. When Jesus uh, says, you know, let these children come unto me. And he seems to be mm -hmm. saying, hey, you don't get to choose who comes to me. Let right. all come to me. Right. As a matter of fact, these young children, people who are dependent on mm -hmm. others, are what the kingdom of God is made Yes. Of. And with their openness and their willingness mm -hmm. to trust God. Can you walk us through this? <laughs> yes, I mean, you have really said most of it right there. But if we remember that children were legal non-entities, and so you loved your own children, but other people's children might count for nothing, this is exactly whom God is saying the kingdom's for. It is not simply for those who have power. It is not for those who have status. It is for those who are forgotten and lost. And drawn into that, we can tag along. We who are not forgotten, who are not lost, who have power, who have ability, can tag along and be joined to that and, and drawn into that. One of the wonderful things in one of the nuptial blessings it talks about and after a happy old life together, may, a happy, long and happy life together, may both of you be welcomed by the poor and the needy whom you have served into the house of God. They're the ones who will say to God, yes, let them in. It's not going to be great people who say, oh, yeah, you can let them in. They're pretty good. It's those people who have been forgotten. And so that sense of drawing into this too. Mm -hmm. And I think too, in this um, month of October, with um, uh, being the month of um, respect for life, to remember that the life of those on the margin, unborn life, elderly life, life of people who are not seen as productive according to the world, mm -hmm. is exactly who the kingdom's for. Yes. And we should not be looking at ending their lives for convenience or for profit or any other reason. Amen. So I just encourage you with those last couple of verses to let those children to you be the example of how to receive 
and how to experience God's kingdom. With that note, Father, would you give us a prayer and a blessing as we wrap yes. up today's session of This Week in the Word? O Lord, bless us all. Draw us more deeply into your life. Make us more in your image. Help us to live in union with you. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you all and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.